Hi, my name is Manoj Bhatti. I'm a pre-sales consultant here at Talis UK. Today I will be taking you through the presentation Building a Robust Response to a Zero Trust World. We have recently released our Talis Data Threat Report 2020 for the European customers. It's a, uh, it covers the entire European region. If you haven't read the report, I will highly recommend you to watch Chris Harris's presentation where he covers the entire report. You'd be uh, able to uh, see and understand where as a European uh, region where we store our data, how the security has been perceived and implemented throughout the region. At Alice, we try to do a small research to find out uh, who's, uh, who's responsible for the data security within an organization. The findings were really surprising for us. We looked at the various different job profiles and the top five priorities of each of these job profiles. We looked at the job profiles for, for the people who were managing application level, um, database level, file and folder or, or operating system level, hypervisor level, and even at the storage level. Surprisingly, only two different levels or layers mention anything about the security. When we looked a little closer at the application level, it actually talks about the application security and not the data security at all. At database level, it does talks about the security of the data. However, at no other um, job description where the top five priority contains security of the data. It does contains performance availability at almost at every single level or layer, but not the security of the data, which is surprising. Today in the market, we see that two different types of attacks. One, um, easy, cheap, and fast, fast attacks, and other are the slow and the deadly attacks. We'll try to cover both of them today. And how do we help in these attacks? We help you, so you have to remember that when the attacks happen, the attacks happen either to steal the identity of, an, of a user, or attack happens to then copy the data or uh, get the data that you have stored within the organization. So this is exactly how we help. This is exactly there and how we help you in securing it. So we help you in authenticating like the hacker is trying to enter the system and encrypt like hacker has already entered the system. These are both relevant for every single organization. Uh, in the old days, everyone knew where exactly to go um, because they had their big office or small office. They had all the applications installed within that, app, uh, within that office. Um, the user identity was stored within that restricted area. And everyone knew um, how to manage the users, the identity, because everyone was within the own office itself, within their own premise. Everything changed 10 to 15 years ago. Slowly and steadily, almost everything went into cloud. So now when a user logs in, He's never logging in within the, the to the server that is within the same organization. In fact, the user changed as well. Now a user is trying to do uh, work or working. A uh, user is working while he's trying to wait uh, for a train at the train station, in an Uber, or even in a train as well. So this has given a lot of freedom and it became really handy in the times like this. However, one of the things that you have to remember when the attack happens, it hardly happens at the application level. It does, but the rarity is there. However, attack always happen at the user level. User are targeted more than the application server. All they want is one of the users to fall in trap of what they're trying to do. If what they're trying to do is to actually steal the identity. Click on that link do something that allows them to take over their identity and this is exactly what they do it is easy it is cheap it is fast and it is repeatable and the hackers don't stop they send you multi they try multiple different ways to then steal your identity once the identity has been stolen their works becomes really easy so much so that they actually were able to create the entire industry around it Business email compromise is a $26 billion industry. It is very easy for them to take over the, um, the emails 
of the of the users they try more and more to take the email um, access of the user which are like the CXOs of within an organization one of the cases they started with just taking over the email of a CEO in few of the cases they have taken taken the emails of CEO and CFOs both so now they are raising a request and they are also authorizing the request as well what exactly are the ways you you're a user in in in, some, in in few cases in your case probably it's an accounts department how many what are the different ways an account department accounts department can actually verify um, the if if the if the payment is genuine if the approval is genuine or not one of the ways is they can actually call to their mobile phone and if they answer they can um, check if the payment is uh, is legitimate or not however how many times someone can actually call and if the user has raised a request or the CEO has requested and CFO has actually approved it do you think um, someone will actually call um, if if you think yes how many times would they actually call it is it is not practically possible to call every single time um, for every single one and this is why the most of these e uh, payments are automatically been done they have never been questioned they only realized after they have been scammed and this is why this is such a big industry so how do we help you with this at Dallas um, we have safe and trusted access this is a very old solution that always provided you the two-factor authentication it was created down 30 years ago however with more and more user came into this and requested we not only started to provide them the second factor of authentication using OTP or one-time password we also created a very um, uh, important and uh, secure sec uh, sing uh, single sign-on solution uh, with uh, safe and trusted access so now a user is not only authenticating itself using the one-time password they are also um, being uh, use they can actually use um, the different the user can be authenticated using different policies um, the, uh, the policies could be the network based they could be uh, device or operating system or even the contextual based policies as well so when the all the po policy criteria are being fulfilled only then user is allowed to enter the system and once such for policy criteria are being met user can then use single sign-on kind of features then access all the different applications it is very easy for any of an organization any of the organizations to then integrate any of our um, any of their applications which are widely available um, on cloud on different cloud applications we have hundreds of them listed we have very simple criteria to integrate the any of the cloud-based application the criteria is if the if the application supports SAML or OIDC protocol, we'll be able to simply integrate this. As I mentioned, there are hundreds of applications already listed on our platform. If you do not see the application name, however, it uh, supports um, the SAML or OIDC platform, please uh, use uh, the generic wizard to then go step by step and integrate the application with our solution. After you have integrated the application, um, you can then use the users group or even applications to put a lot of different policies these policies allows user to uh, be authenticated based on uh, scenarios uh, compliances or different uh, uh, set of uh, rules uh, that you can accept by, as an organization once all these rules have been set you can then monitor the risk and then adjust the risk accordingly uh, according to your organization needs with star or safe and trusted access we actually are able to provide you the smart single sign-on which is adapted and contextual attributes based these attributes are network operating system user devices location and many more you can actually define step up or step down kind of authentication so if a user is logged in to you know uh, to uh, if a user is logged in um, to a network to an application within your own data center as and when you go to go back
back to office, you can actually step down the authentication just because the user is already in the office. You can simply say, if the user supplies the username and the password, it's good enough for me because he's coming from uh, a trusted network. If the user goes outside, for example, pops into Starbucks or any other cafe, tries to connect to their Wi-Fi and then try to access the application, it's a step up authentication for them because now they have to provide the one-time password to access the same application just because the context has changed, the network has changed. Similarly, if a user is using a certain operating system, you can simply define a user. Um, users can use a certain operating system or even the version of operating systems itself or not. So you can define user should only be using Windows and not Mac just because your organization never issued a Mac machines or you can uh, define uh, the, the organization has provided Android phones or for example, iPhones to all the users. So any um, authentication request that comes from um, other platforms will be simply denied. Uh, also, you can simply say the user device, if a user has not used, uh, you have the, a user has to authenticate its device um, every five days, seven days, a month, so that uh, you know that the user is actually coming from the right devices or the same devices, or even the, the locations. You can blacklist any of the locations. So for example, as a global organization, you want your users to log, uh, go in all different countries. However, for example, North to North Korea, you can actually um, uh, put North Korea in a blacklist or any other country as well. These are the different contactual ways to actually authenticate a user. However, now comes the question, how do you actually deliver the OTP? We have the biggest um, chunk of software as well as the hardware-based tokens. So our software-based tokens can be installed on iPhones, Android, um, laptops, desktops, uh, Mac OS X, um, the Blackberries, Windows-based phones, and we also have the SMS-based or the email-based tokens that can be installed anywhere. That can be used with any of the uh, uh, any of the mobile phones if they have the, the reception. If they do not want to install the software token on their phone, they should be receiving an SMS or um, they can actually receive email as well for the token. Um, if users simply deny uh, installing any app or receiving any SMS on their phone, you can give them a hardware-based token, which are very popular. And using the same hardware-based token, for example, if you want to authenticate your users to Office 365, you can do that just because we are completely vendor agnostic solution. We also have a very special token called a grid-based or a pattern-based token. This grid-based token is a grid of five by five, six by six, or a seven by seven numbers. When a token has been issued to a user, user chooses its pattern. Now, the, when the grid comes uh, being displayed um, to, uh, for a user, this user has to choose uh, his or her own pattern and the number um, that comes in front of them are completely refreshed every single time. So it's a fresh set of numbers. So the numbers in their um, pattern becomes their OTP or one-time password. Now, uh, every single time uh, a user, uh, the, the, the user uh, tries to tries to log into an application, they have to authenticate using uh, this pattern-based token. But the token is not something that they have. This is something that's been populated, and we understand this is not exactly a true two-factor authentication because it's not something that you have. It's been populated. Um, however, it's still a one-time password, and it's much secure than the password itself. Uh, we also have the PKI-based tokens, and later this year, um, we will be uh, we, uh, later this year or beginning of next year, we will be launching our FIDO tokens as well. One of the other special tokens is uh, is called a Mobile Pass Plus token. This actually gives you the the capabilities of using one-time password as a push notification. It is amazing. It's a great user experience. So for a user, if you look on the screen, user tries, is trying to access an application. Let's say, for example, Office 365. When the user tries to log in, they put in their username. Um, they actually see a, a, a pop-up on their phone saying um, Office 365 is trying to access the token. They approve it. 
and they approve it using their biometrics if, uh, if their phone supports face, uh, face, um, uh, face ID, they, they authenticate using face ID. If um, their phone supports finger ID, then they authenticate using finger ID. And when they, as soon as they authenticate, the OTP has been then pushed from their phone to the application. So user doesn't effectively have to write down or type in the OTP at any place. And it is an amazing experience. Uh, the, just because um, user doesn't have to type anything and everything happens automatically. This is how we are able to create the passwordless authentication. A user is able to simply use the token, uh, authenticate, and just because we are not only dealing with um, the uh, unlocking of the phone, we also have the authentication on the app itself. That simply means if a phone is lying unlocked unknowingly, any of your colleague, anyone who is in your close proximity would not be able to uh, use your token just because the phone was unlocked. The other benefit of this is that once uh, you log in to the application, you know you can authenticate the user just because it doesn't rely on the phone unlocking security itself. Our tokens can be only installed one time. So once a user receives uh, uh, a link to install our tokens, when as soon as they click on that link and install it, the link expires. Um, the other level of security that we have pushed uh, uh, into the token is the seed is never open itself. The moment you install the token, the same seed is generated at the device level and um, as it generates at the, at the server level. So the seed is never being sent over the air at all. It's being automatically generated when you install the token. It makes the whole thing amazingly secure. As you all know, um, when you have a good start, it's a battle half won. This is, if you're able to implement the second factor of authentication with single sign-on, you're not only giving amazing level of security to the users, it's also a great user experience and, and it's amazingly secure. Uh, make, make the whole environment very, very secure. For a hacker to log in, they have to now break the one-time password, which let's say it's very, very hard just because not only you, they have to work out the, um, the six-digit code, they also have to then break all the other contextual based um, the policies that you have put in. Again, based on the users, uh, the users' operating system, networks, uh, devices, um, geolocations, and all, or all of them combined together. Once that happens, what's the next step? The next step is the data. This is where the slow and the deadly attacks happen. So what happens when someone is trying to attack you and trying to steal your data? In the old times, we were trying to create a zero trust environment by putting more and more and more firewalls, just because at that point of time, you wanted to stop anyone, you had to use the technology of firewalls that blocks the other. And this kept on for a few years before everything get out of control and went into cloud. And this is where the the whole uh, the the security and then being started to being perceived as a fight between security and availability. And everything falls just because the security is being perceived as a threat to availability. This is why at the application level, you will see programmers keeping a copy of their code somewhere safe. At the database level, you will see multiple copies of the databases, one encrypted, which is in production, or the unencrypted, which is, let's say, um, so-called hidden, but in a completely unencrypted way, unencrypted uh, form. Um, at, the, uh, at the operating system level, you see multiple uh, copies of the machine, snapshots, which are left unencrypted with, um, with the sensitive data lying on them. At the storage level, the same thing. You, if, there is a, uh, if there is a folder, if there is a storage, uh, if there is a share, which is deemed very uh, sensitive, they create multiple copies of it, often unencrypted, just because 
they are they feel the availability they have a sla to maintain and this is why they create multiple copies of these databases or the, the storages and this is exactly where the security fails security is not a compromise to availability and this is what we are trying to tell you um, when we speak to our customers we have often heard for years and years they say one two two different sentences um, in a single breath one they would simply say yes we would like to uh, secure protect our data and the second thing they say in the same breath is they don't know where the data is um, at some point of time it will stop sounding funny however this is exact reason why we came up with um, the three point solutions or a security uh, that is on three different points so we help you in discovering the sensitive data protecting the sensitive data and then controlling the data and the keys together we're able to achieve this by using our uh, key management solution we called it as cypher trust manager we always had a key management solution it was called key secure then few years ago we started calling it um, just because uh, uh, we, we we refresh uh, the underneath hardware uh, we refresh the underneath code uh, it was then uh, termed as the key secure next gen now it was time to refresh the whole thing again and now it's called cypher trust manager it is a solution that is a combination of two different key management solution one historically came from safenet or jimolso and the other one that came from more metric talus or it was called dsm so the cypher trust management uh, uh, cypher trust manager is a combination of both it is an amazing solution it helps you in storing generating uh, generating storing um, the, the keys at one single location uh, and also storing the security policy that you would be using all the different encryption connectors with in the same place um, you can manage it using rest apis we also have the apis to provide you the encryption um, using rest java.net um, it also have the multi-tenant capabilities to give you a complete multi-tenant um, environment um, when, when you're trying to use it within the same uh, organization. Uh, the best thing, it's available as both virtual and the hardware at once. Using the Cypress Management Data Discovery Platform, you should be data discovery and classification platform. You should be able to discover the data that's been stored anywhere or everywhere. You can actually um, discover the data that's been stored in cloud, in cloud databases or cloud storages databases. Again, cloud databases or local databases anywhere. File shares, NAS storages, or even the big data databases. Once you're able to discover the data, you should then be able to put remediation on the data. Maybe you would want users to delete the data where it lies because there are multiple copies and you do not like to have a data on a certain server because that's unsecured, that is outside of the scope of um, your security policies. Or you would like the data to be encrypted. It could be a remediation step or put, if you cannot do anything, just put a compensating controls on it temporarily so that you know at least to start with where exactly your data is and then create the policies around that. It also shows uh, dashboards which are uh, can be differentiated in terms of uh, the IT manager or CX or CEO uh, level uh, dashboards as well and then the reporting and compliance you can have reports uh, uh, periodically uh, you can run the scans periodically to see where exactly the data is lying if the, the data that was lying on a certain server last time uh, is it still lying there if the data size has increased, if the sensitive data size has increased? Um, and if um, if you still are able to find the data at the same places, you can raise questions why, why, why the data is still lying there. And again, go back to the first step, take the remediation steps. However, the capabilities of a Cypher Trust Key Manager doesn't stop there. It helps you in encrypting and securing data at various different levels and various different places within an organization. So if you're using databases, you can use the transparent data encryption if you're using MySQL or Oracle databases. This is where 
we encrypt the data using the capabilities of Oracle and MS SQL. However, you store that key into the CyberTrust Manager. We can also use our integration um, that we have within our ecosystem using PKCS 11 and using KMET protocol, which is a key management interoperability protocol. You should be able to simply encrypt the data at various different hardware or software based solution. That includes NetApp NSEs, Dell Component Selector Encrypting Drives, VMware and VMware use case is one of the biggest use case that we have seen for KMET which is where you encrypt the virtual machines or vSANs using VMware and offload the key onto the KMS system. Uh, Nutanix, Pure, these are uh, the different uh, integrations that we have. However, the integrations are not limited to this. Any software, any hardware that supports KMIP can be integrated with CyberTrust Manager. And above all, if you see in the right-hand side of the screen, we also have the key management for your cloud-based keys. So if you're using um, AWS KMS, if you're using Azure eVault, you should, uh, because you're using certain applications where uh, a cloud has um, directed you to use uh, the local KMS and use BYOK capabilities with that, you can generate the keys within the Cypher Trust Key Manager and push it onto AWS or uh, Azure Key Vaults, KMS Key Vaults. Um, and then manage the entire life cycle of the key right from the single pane of glass. You should be able to rotate the key automatically. You should be generate, delete, anything that you want, and you do not have to log in to your cloud to meet a KMS. You should be able to do it from a single pane of glass. It, the entire thing is automated, and you do not have to then um, issue any of the command line based commands at all. It is very, very, um, amazing feature of the of the Cypher Scheme Manager. With the Cypher Scheme Manager, the the security of the data, as we said, is a top priority. We help you in encrypting at the various different other ways as well, using the data discovery um, and classification tools. If you find a data that is structured data, for example, credit card numbers, passport numbers, um, national insurance numbers. Um, driving license numbers and if you'd like to put tokenization we have the tokenization solution that you can use with Cypher Trust Scheme Manager. Uh, this tokenization solution is both vaulted and vaultless completely uh, uh, flexible to your needs so if you want a vaulted or vaultless solution uh, you, you should be able to choose any one of them with this. For database protection this can be done multiple different ways we have covered TDE or transparent data encryption we have covered KMIT uh, for some of the databases. However, if if any, if your database that you're using doesn't support any of the native encryptions, or if you like to have a standardized way of encrypting databases, you can use a file and folder level encryption solution and encrypt a database, databases, or multiple different databases at the file and folder level, and then put policies, which are access policies, on the on the uh, on the file and folder of the databases itself. You can simply say the system administrator doesn't have any access. However, at the same time, the process, for example, if it's a SQL server, the EXE has full access on the data. This would mean if a system administrator logs in with his all administrative privileges, tries to copy the data, takes it away, he's only copying the encrypted data because the key with which it is encrypted lies in the Cypher Trust Key Manager. So the security that you're getting is amazing. And then the cloud key management and the local key management feature always comes with it. So how does it all fits together? At the top of the um, of the diagram, you should be able to see these are all the different points or the places where the data is stored. Using the data discovery and classification solution, you should be able to find the data there using the key management underneath you should be able to encrypt the data and the secure the data at all the different all these places and many more you can then use our hardware security modules or hsms as a root of trust for the key management servers to provide you that extra layer of protection and then use the hsms for all different needs including pki and then all the other where you have you can use the SSL offloading facility of the HSM. 
that includes Palo Alto, FI, Citrix and Scala. You also have integration with Cybar, Renify. Um, now, if, you, if you're trying to use um, the, the newer vendors like P-Factor or AppUX, you also have integrations with those as well. Um, and then if you're trying to copy the data from one data center to other data center, you can use our high speed encryptors, which encrypts the data at the layer two at an amazingly high speed. We have from one gig to 10 gig and 100 gig devices that helps you in almost uh, transferring the data almost at the right time, real time. Um, the latency that we have with a 100 gig box is less than one microsecond. That is 10 raised to power minus six of a second. They're amazingly fast. Um, so with that, I conclude today's presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Have a good day. Bye.